Hi, Zero 200. I'm laughing because we started this video once and I had no idea what day it was. So <laughs> we started again. Today is Tuesday, June 22nd. The year is 2021. I know what day it is. So anyway, we're going to talk about durable power of attorney um, and for financial purposes. And we're also going to talk about elder abuse. And those two things sadly go hand in hand. Um, we see the number one type of elder abuse in the United States is financial abuse. So one way to avoid that is to have someone managing your affairs when you become maybe a little bit uh, less capable of doing it on your own. Um, but then again, one way to have financial abuse is to give the financial power of attorney to the wrong person. So we have the PDF uh, file right here, and we also have the link. So, so let's go to the PDF. File. Yes. So we have this great resource from AARP, and um, they have so much on their website. It's it's really really good. So um, props to them for this. So. Um, Having a power of attorney is important. So I have a power of attorney that names John as my agent. So just like a real estate agent, remember we talked about this last week, if I'm gonna go buy a house, I get someone that's gonna represent me and look after my interests and be loyal to me. I've named John as my um, uh, power of attorney for financial purposes. And um, if he's unable to serve, my oldest son is second and my youngest son is third. So I'm covered if I'm not able to handle things myself, either because I'm sick or maybe I'm out of town or something like that, um, they can execute documents. I've given them a very broad power of attorney that gives them the power to do pretty much anything that needs to be done in, in my name. So it's important to know that when you set up a power of attorney, you are the principal. So you're the person with the money, you're the person with the finances that need to be managed. And then, um, you name someone your agent or attorney, in fact, and that person is the person who will be signing documents, paying bills, helping you sell your house, you know, sell your car, whatever. Now, with these um, power of attorney forms, you can typically make them very, very narrow. So I only want to allow this person to access this specific bank account to pay these specific bills, or you can make it broad. Um, I trust John. <laughs> We've been together for 9,000 years. So, and he's very fiscally prudent and very um, good with money. So I trust him. I know that um, he's not going to, you know, sign away my 401k or sell the house out from under me. Um, so you can give them the power to do everything, buy and sell stocks, pay your bills, um, you know, pay your medical bills, which is really important file your income tax returns, and you do all of these things in your name. Um, you can decide how you want this to work. Now, the power of attorney that we have is a durable power of attorney. That means that if he needs to sign a document on my behalf tomorrow, he can do it. I don't have to be declared incompetent first. As a lawyer, I kind of like that because it's clear. I trust him. I know he, he's capable of, of doing this. Um, I'm fine with giving him this power right now, even though I am capable and competent and have the ability to execute these powers myself. Um, but for convenience purposes, I'm giving him that power now. A springing power of attorney only goes into effect, springs into effect, when um, the principal or a person who has the money that needs to be managed, when that person becomes incapacitated. So when you raise that issue, now you have a little bit of a factual determination that has to be made. Someone has to say this person's incompetent in terms of financial purposes and can no longer manage their own financial affairs. So um, the good news about a springing power of attorney is you don't have to worry about someone going behind your back and selling your house out from under you or emptying your bank accounts or doing anything like that as long as you're still competent. The bad news is that you might get into some sort of fight about whether or not you're competent. You think you still are, they think you're not, and, and you can get into a little bit of a scuffle. Um, you can have a conventional power of attorney, which is the number one on the list, which begins when you sign it and ends when you become mentally incapacitated. So there's different choices in terms of what you can do. Now, unlike a um, durable power of attorney for healthcare, which is free on the internet. You can go out and find good forms and every state has a form that they provide for free. 
Um, the, usually the Bar Association provides it for free. The American Bar Association does. The, um, usually doctors will provide one for free. Your hospital will provide one for free. In the case of a durable power of attorney for financial, you typically are going to need to get a lawyer to draft it for you. There are some options online and on the internet that we'll talk about next week. Um, all of these powers of attorney um, expire when the person dies, so that's kind of an important thing to know. And um, if you draft a power of attorney, let's say I name John, and two years from now, I find out that John is not the person I thought he was. <laughs> he, or, or let's take a happier approach. <laughs> maybe John just, maybe he becomes sick and he's incompetent. So he's not the guy that I want to manage my financial decisions. So if I want to terminate my power of attorney, I can rip it up. I can write a statement in writing that says this is no longer valid. I can, so writing that I want to cancel it, I can sign a new one. So if you've signed multiple power of attorneys, whichever one is the most recent one is going to prevail, assuming that you were competent at the time that you signed it. So um, of course, if you rip up your power of attorney, it's polite to tell the person that you had designated as your agent that they're no longer um, going to be your agent and they're no longer going to be able to do that. Now, something to think about. If you are the agent, so let's say you have a grandparent or an aunt or an uncle that needs help paying their bills. They name you their agent under their durable power of attorney for financial. You have a fiduciary duty to them. That means the duty of highest, highest loyalty. You don't own the money in their bank accounts. You don't own their house. You don't own their car. You're going to be acting on their behalf in their interest. So you can only pay their bills. That doesn't mean you can go in and say, you know, I kind of wanted to go to Coachella and the tickets are really expensive and I wanted to get the really good ones with the, you know, the backstage access and the nice air conditioned place where you go hang out. So I'm going to take, you know, a couple thousand and buy tickets for me and my friends and, you know, grandma won't notice. You can't do that. You are a fiduciary. You owe a duty of loyalty. You can't use that money for your benefit. It only can be used for their benefit. Um, now, by the same token, and we see this time and time and time again, people that have tremendous wealth, a lot of times, let's say you're in Hollywood and you become a famous movie star or you're a professional athlete and you just don't have time to really manage your own financial affairs. So you give a financial manager, power of attorney to manage your finances for you. And then it turns out you've made a bad decision. So then that person has committed fraud. They've drained your accounts. They've used your credit cards. They've gone out and bought, you know, Rolex watches and, and the best champagne and, and, you know, spent a lot of money in places they shouldn't have for their own benefit. Um, that happens time and time and time again. So just because you give someone power of attorney doesn't mean that you should stop monitoring your accounts. So you still need to be um, keeping an eye on those people that you've given this power over your finances. So make sure that, that you monitor your accounts. You know, you should be getting monthly statements. You should be checking your credit card statements or, or have a second person as a fail safe. So never give all the power to one person. It can end badly. And we've seen very smart, very educated people. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, I think, lost everything at one point in his career because he trusted the wrong person. So we see this over and over and over again. Have a backup, 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 backup. And, and, and really, like we showed you in the previous weeks, um, uh, lesson plans, you know, you, you can be your own money manager all right you can be your own financial counselor and you, just because you know you're starting to get older you stay on top of it don't just <laughs> relinquish and I'm, I'm going to go to this website um again uh julie was talking about arp and so uh again there's so many different um, components right here so uh again this this is a, an update of, about what's going on from 2019 um in in, in interesting stories too. So please do go ahead and take a look at that. All right. Yeah. So, so. And, and if you are named agent for a relative that um, is having a little trouble managing their own affairs, make sure that you're educated about, you know, what are their assets? What are their needs? What do they need to have money spent on? And um, you may find that your lawyer or their lawyer has drafted a financial power of attorney document 
But when you go to the bank, the bank wants you to get their signed. So if you have a, a relative who's starting to show signs of dementia or diminished capacity, before it get, progresses too far, make sure that you've got all the paperwork in order for their bank accounts with their financial institutions. I mean, as a lawyer, it irritates the heck out of me when banks don't respect those documents that were drafted by people like me, but it is what it is. And it can be easier if you just go through the, with the bank's form and use their forms for, for their, their accounts. Now, I wanna talk about elder abuse. And um, a lot of the data that we're talking about is US data. However, I think it's important to recognize that elder abuse is happening around the globe. It is um, a tragic, tragic thing. And, and I know there are many, many countries that do a much better job than the U.S. in terms of respecting and really cherishing elders and, and having a culture of respect and, and caregiving. However, even in those countries, we still see, the World Health Organization still sees Elder abuse, because people are overwhelmed, caregivers are overwhelmed. And so um, we've got to be alert to it. We've got to recognize the fact that with our population rap rapidly aging around the globe, that there are going to be more opportunities for um, elder abuse. Go up just a little bit. Okay, so um, what are the major types of elder abuse and what are the, the most commonly um, seen ones in the U.S.? The number one type of elder abuse in the U.S. is financial abuse by a family member. So grandma has a house, grandma has a bank account, grandma has a pension, she's getting social security checks, and her nephew or her son or her granddaughter or her niece or somebody moves into the house and starts rifling through her bank accounts, using her credit cards, you know, bad things can happen. The number two is neglect. So failure to provide um, food, shelter, clothing, et cetera. Number three is emotional abuse. And this goes hand in hand with caregivers who are overwhelmed. You're working a full-time job. You're trying to take care of mom and dad or grandma and grandpa, and you're just stretched too thin. And that can lead to elder abuse. So not all these people that are elder abusers are bad people. They're, they're people in bad situations. Um, physical abuse and sexual abuse, thankfully, are less common. They're easier to pick up, too. When a doctor sees a patient that has unusual bruising or broken glasses or marks on their wrists or cigarette burns, the doctor's going to know right away, and they are mandated reporters, so they're going to report that, and it's going to be prosecuted. Um, why? One of the things that we talk about is, you know, who are the abusers? Most of the time, they're family members. So, they can be um, children, spouses, um, you know, boyfriends, girlfriends, uh, just people in that family network, because those are the people that have contact with the elderly person. And those are the people who um, have the most opportunity to abuse the elderly person. Now, um, that leads hand in hand to one of the statistics we'll talk about in a minute. Elder abuse tends to not be reported. 93% of elder abuse in the US is not reported. Why? Because people are ashamed. People are sad. They don't want to get their loved one in trouble. You can have an abusive child and still love that child. And you think, you know, my, my, my son or my daughter or my niece or my nephew is a, maybe an opioid addict and has stolen money from me and has threatened me and has been verbally abusive to me. But as, as you know, me as grandma or mom or dad is just thinking, oh, I, I just know they're going to pull it together. I know they're going to get better. I know they're going to beat their addiction. And I know that if I report them, they're going to end up in prison and, you know, their lives going to be ruined. So, so family members are, elderly people are very reluctant to report their own family members for abuse. And they feel ashamed and humiliated that this is happening to them. Now, people with dementia create an even worse issue because they are very much more likely to be abused. Taking care of someone with dementia is very difficult, very demanding. Um, and they, but they are also, um, I think, viewed as unreliable reporters. So if someone with dementia says, so-and-so hit me, or so-and-so stole from me, other people might say, oh, it's the dementia talking, it's not real. And I think that we all have to take a moment and, and try to figure out if someone with dementia is accusing someone else of mistreating them, 
let's just make really sure that they're not telling the truth. Let's make sure that it is the dementia talking. Now, having said that, funny story in John's family, um, his, uh, his grandmother, bless her heart, lived with his mom and dad for many, many decades before she passed away. And she would frequently um, say she would come up with kind of these, you know, harebrained schemes like they're stealing money from me. And and we were like, oh, you really actually have no money. <laughs> so no one's stealing anything from you because you have nothing. <laughs> but um, uh, it's easy to laugh about it now. But at the time, it was kind of hard to have her, you know, she would spiral into paranoia. But, you know, it, it, it can happen. So anyway, um, what are the types of, what is the effect of elder abuse? So self-neglect, where the, the elderly person is, is not taking care of themselves, um, increases the likelihood of death within a year significantly. So 5.82 times greater than not self-neglecting. Um, and even if you survived, you were more likely to die um, soon afterwards. Now, if you are a conver- confirmed victim of elder abuse, you're twice is likely to die. If you are a suspected victim of elder abuse, you're 1.4 times more likely to die as compared to someone who hasn't been abused at all. Um, so, so I think it's going to cause a lot of stress, a lot of depression, a lot of anxiety, uh, in addition to the physical impact of, of being perhaps physically abused or neglected. So the World Health Organization has kind of this nice little graphic that talks and explains the different types of elder abuse, physical abuse, where someone's being hit or pushed or restrained, Um, psychological or emotional abuse, where people are, you know, calling the elderly person names or threatening them or keeping them confined, Um, sexual abuse. And, And sadly, we do see in facilities with people who have dementia that there can be a lot of sexual activity going on if it's non-consensual. And then it's a hotly debated topic in the gerontology community. If it's non-consensual, um, you know, that that's definitely a, a huge, huge issue. Financial exploitation, of course, is the number one thing we're seeing in the U.S. Um, taking that person's money, taking their credit card, taking their social security check and neglect or abandonment. We've seen horrible cases of neglect or abandonment where a paid caregiver or a family member can just stop providing food, stop providing care, um, you know, and with, with really, really tragic, tragic outcomes. So the two groups that have the most opportunity and as a result are most often elder abusers are family members and healthcare workers. So we see these healthcare workers in facilities who may be committing sexual abuse who may be um, uh, verbally abusing their patients. They may be um, neglecting their patients and not responding. And so it's really important, and I teach a whole class about this to master students, that we do effective background checks and that we um, respond to patient complaints when we're, when we're looking at a facility and you know, we want to make sure that we have the highest quality people we can get to work in that facility, even though we're paying really low amounts of money. So it's a it's a challenge to staff these facilities with people who are, I think, natural caregivers. So I want to talk a little bit more about um, information from the World Health Organization about what are the risk factors for elder abuse in terms of being the victim and in terms of being the abuser. So if you look on the right-hand side, it looks, the the middle says risk factors. The right-hand side says the strength of the evidence. So having a significant disability. So if you've got mobility issues, or if you've got speech issues, or if you've got hearing or vision issues, if you've got a significant disability, maybe you're a cancer um, patient, maybe you have Parkinson's, all of these things can affect your ability to defend yourself, to have contact with the outside world, And so that gives you a pretty strong risk factor for um, for uh, being dependent on others and subsequently being abused, being in poor physical health, having depression. When you have depression, it's kind of hard to to get up in the morning and and rally and even maybe know that, hey, I don't deserve this bad treatment. Um, and being of low income or socioeconomic um, status. One of my law school professors famously used to say, rich people get better stuff. Um, and they do. Rich people get better stuff. They've, they're going to have people coming in and out of their homes. They're going to have 
a cleaning lady. They're going to have um, paid caregivers. They're going to have, um, you know, a gardener. They're going to have, you know, groceries being delivered. So they have all of these people coming in to perhaps check on them. And any one of those people might be alert to, hey, this person doesn't look right. It doesn't mean that being rich keeps you from being a victim of elder abuse. And we've seen many, many um, very, very famous cases of that, um, often by their by their family members. But being low income uh, um, definitely hurts. So who are the abusers? They're people that are themselves struggling with mental health issues. So you're depressed. Um, they're people that are struggling with substance abuse issues. So you might be abusing drugs or alcohol, which you know can can impact your ability to control your emotions and to handle difficult situations. And you might be dependent on the um, older person. So you're financially dependent on them. Um, they are a relative or you're emotionally dependent on them. So that's how the children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews, and sometimes spouses can become abusers because maybe you are financially and emotionally dependent upon this person. Um, so all of those things are, are kind of issues. Having um, Living alone with the um, victim and you don't have other people around to check, that can be another big issue too. So um, the next graphic is just different experts in this area talking about what are the risk factors and what are the things that we can do. Um, what the guy on the left says seniors are, are, are at risk for financial abuse and financial exploitation because they have money. The older you get, if you're lucky, you've got a pension or a 401k, you've got social security checks coming, you may own a home, you may have a car, you know, just, just by virtue of living long enough, you might have accumulated assets or accumulated even a small amount of wealth. But, you know, if you have an abusive relative, they're going to know that grandma's social security check gets deposited at this time of the month, and then they're gonna come sniffing around looking for money. Um, the middle expert says um, the, the issue that we deal with with Chinese older adults is that people who are um, victims of elder abuse have a much higher risk of suicide because they are ashamed and they're dealing with the stigma of being abused because it's so counter to the culture of of having so much respect and care for the elderly that these people think, ah, if this is happening to me, I'd rather just die than deal with the, um, the outcome of it. Um, and then the people on the bottom are talking about some of the things you can do to avoid elder abuse. Stay, keep these people socially active, keep them socially engaged, keep them involved in their communities. So isolation is a friend to elder abuse and social connection combats elder abuse. Um, making sure that you've got um, multiple people helping you with your financial affairs so that you've got, you know, let's say you are, um, you know, um, who's an incredibly wealthy person? Us? No. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, yeah. LeBron James, okay? Yeah. He's mm -hmm. got some money. He's young. He probably has people managing his, his money for him. He's also a very, very smart businessman. And I guarantee you that his financial manager has an accountant that watches over him. And the accountant probably has a lawyer watching over him. And he's got layers of protection. And that's I'm, why. I'm Rupert Murdoch. Yeah, well, <laughs> we're not going to go there. <laughs> but anyway, OK, now we, I want to talk a little bit about loneliness and isolation. It is so huge. And I say, we talk about this all the time. If there was one thing that I would love to see happen in the U.S. is to get some sort of volunteer or, or you know, entry-level job brigade of people that are paid by Medicare and Medicaid to just go to a senior person's house and make them breakfast, take them for a walk around the block, just talk to them once a day. It would make it would make life and death differences in terms of health. So, um, being lonely is has the same health effect as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Um, people who are older, uh, the risk factors that increase um, loneliness and isolation, being over 80. So you're more frail. You're not getting around. You might not be driving anymore. Having chronic health problems, and that keeps you home as well. Not having family contact having low income. So you're, you can't afford to, you know, go to the Bahamas or whatever on vacation and having changing family structures. So maybe there's been divorce in your family. Maybe there's been um, 
some, some, you know, some people in your family you've lost touch with, maybe for good reasons, maybe for bad. And so we need to think about what can we do to alleviate this loneliness and keep our seniors engaged in their communities, connected socially, get them, a- get them access to transportation, um, maybe get them volunteer opportunities. And now we're seeing a lot of um, technology use so that um, especially during the pandemic when seniors have been so isolated if they live in assisted living or um, nursing homes that um, using technology it was a lifeline to seniors in, in those facilities. So our last prompt for the discussion is, you know, have you seen evidence of elder abuse? How did it make you feel? What do you think we should be doing about elder abuse? I've seen it in my life. My um, stepdad was a victim of elder abuse. My um, brother-in-law, John's brother, he technically, he was like 64 when it happened, but he had a friend who was kind of sketchy, who started charging him money to do things around the house. And next thing you know, he was charged like $85,000 for some pretty minor um, projects around his house. And, uh, and, and it can happen just like that. Too. So I had to step in and yeah. say, <laughs> no more, no more hanging out with, um, what was, what was Floyd. Floyd, no more Floyd. Floyd was no good. Um, but you know, so he's a smart guy and was taken advantage of and he had family and, and, so you know, friend, the friend twisted the, we wasn't a true friend. He twisted the, the meaning of, of friendship. Yeah. 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 So. so anyway, we've seen it. It is tragic and it's horrible. Um, so let us know your stories and, uh, you know. Awesome. We had a couple of glitches in the oh. discussion <laughs> that don't worry about it. We're on the back end. We're able to kind of see what's going on. We apologize. Blackboard has uh, some some strange Jenga, Jenga like moving parts and we, we thought we'd repaired it and we didn't. But yeah, don't, so- don't, it's on us. You guys don't worry about yes. it. Yes. So. Um, with Blackboard, um, Blackboard is a beast. And uh, we had some issues with the class last semester. So we rebuilt it from scratch this semester. And because of that, there have been a few hiccups. Yeah. Um, but we'll fix it. You guys will get yeah. your points. Don't worry about it. Um, yeah. Kat and Catherine, thank you. You helped us out. Kate, through, Kate you, helped, you, helped, you helped us out on the, front, on, the, on the front end of the course. And then lo and behold, I've discovered a couple that I thought I fixed on the back end that I didn't. We, so. um, we very much appreciate it when students tell yeah, us yeah, about absolutely. Blackboard we're not, problems. We're not perfect. Because it's very helpful. So thank, thank you very much. For all right, you guys. Peace. We'll Bye. see you. Fight on.